Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 71. Today I'll be nearing the end of this series on the Kingdom Fungi by exploring a large clade known as the Basidiomycota. You know these fungi as mushrooms, and puffballs, and brackets, and conchs, earth stars, stinkhorns, jelly fungi, and more. The majority of the macroscopic, colorful, exotic fungal fruiting bodies that you see in the wilderness from mushrooms to puffballs to jelly fungi, they all belong to the Basidiomycota. Alongside the Ascomycota, these two groups form a clade called the Dicaria. In the previous episode, I began by exploring the early evolution of the fungal kingdom, and how one of the major branching events created this Dicaria lineage. The Dicaria lineage are characterized by the presence of Dicarions, or cells that possess two unfused nuclei. During the process of sexual replication, hyphae from two individuals, with cells equipped with one nuclei each, will come into contact with each other. These monokaryotic cells, in direct contact, will fuse their plasma membranes through a process called plasmogamy, to create a larger single cell with two distinct nuclei. This is the dicaryotic cell and it can replicate itself in a coordinated fashion, so that each separate nuclei is also replicated, and the new daughter cell is also dicaryotic, with two distinct separate nuclei. At some point in the growth cycle, the nuclei in these dicaryotic cells will fuse and undergo karyogamy, recombination, and meiosis. In the previous episode, I talked about how the Ascomycota would do this relatively quickly. They don't spend a whole lot of time in the dicaryophase. They basically organize the dicaryotic hyphae to form fruiting bodies right away, and these produce ASCII. And these ASCII produce and release spores relatively quickly. So they just kind of shuttle through this dicaryotic phase as fast as they can. Now, the Basidiomycota also have both monokaryotic and dicaryotic phases, but they tend to spend much more time in the dicaryotic phase. Their dicaryotic phase is much more dominant and longer lasting, so this is a good place to start our exploration of the Basidiomycota. One of the most important physiological structures that keep the Basidiomycota in the dicaryophase for so long are the clamp connections. These clamp connections are tube like structures that maintain the separate nuclei in each newly produced cell. When the dicaryotic cells at the tip of the hyphae are dividing, They'll begin by growing larger, and then duplicating their organelles and both of the nuclei. So let's say that the cell at the end of the hyphae has nuclei A and nuclei B. Nuclei A will copy itself, and each copy will then move to either end of the cell. One will move to the back of the cell, closer to the rest of the cells in the hyphae, while the other nuclei will move to the tip of the cell, towards the very tip of the hyphae. As this happens, a septa will begin to form in the middle of the elongated, soon-to-divide cell. This septa will physically separate the copies of nuclei A, and it sections off the cytoplasm to establish the boundaries of the newly produced cell, which now sits at the very tip of the hyphae. Immediately behind this new cell is the parent cell that just gave birth to it, or that just created it, and this parent cell hosts the other copy of nuclei A. Now, nuclei B also replicates itself, but it moves a little bit differently. One copy of nuclei B will move to the very tip of the new cell, much like the copy of nuclei A, but the other copy of nuclei B will do something entirely different. As the septa is forming, this copy of nuclei B can't just punch through it. It has to find a more elegant solution. That solution is the clamp connection. This structure is a tube that protrudes out of the side of the newly forming cell at the very tip of the hyphae. This tube will hook backwards, and then it will dive into the membrane of the previous parent cell. This establishes an extracellular corridor running outside of the cell themselves, and it bypasses the septa. The second copy of nuclei B will slide down this tube to be deposited in the parent cell. These clamp connections facilitate the preservation of the dicaryotic phase. They can keep the fungi in this dicaryotic phase for months, for years, or even decades, or even centuries. 
And during all of this time, the dicaryotic mycelia will be growing out through the soil, or through the dead plant that it's growing on, looking for food and colonizing new areas. When the time comes to reproduce, the dicaryotic mycelia will create a fruiting body, or a basidiocarp, or more commonly known as a mushroom, or a puffball, or whatever. This basidiocarp is the macroscopic organ that's used to mass-produce and release spores. And because all of these spores are created through meiosis, they generate a lot of genetic diversity. So while the basidiomycota can use their vegetative mycelia to undergo mitosis and produce spores and reproduce asexually, they can also produce these basidia and these fruiting bodies to reproduce sexually. Now, it's technically sexual reproduction because it involves the fusion of two separate nuclei into a diploid cell and then meiosis to produce genetically varied haploid gamete cells. It's just that, because of the prolonged nature of the basidiomycota dicarion phase, this fertilization and meiosis can happen weeks, months, or even years after the parent fungi have actually physically met and fused to create this dicaryotic offspring. Another interesting fact is that the basidiomycota don't really have male or female forms. They have mating types. Now, other fungi have mating types, but some species have just two mating types, and we can loosely define them as male or female. I mean, for example, perhaps the male mating type has small, mobile gametes, and the female mating type has larger, less mobile gametes. So in this way, it's kind of like sperm and eggs. Or perhaps the male mating type releases its gametes, and the female mating type holds its gametes onto its body, and the offspring is grown, at least temporarily, on the female's body. The female provides nutrients, and so in that sense, it's kind of like animal pregnancy. But these basidiomycota don't really do this. They don't have this. Anatomically and physiologically, their mating types are all more or less the same. They don't have male or female. And the compatibility of their mating types depends on sharing the right types of alleles, on the right genes. These basidiomycota just have certain types of alleles that can be compatible with other certain types of alleles, and this allows for their nuclei to successfully fuse together. Now, the fruiting bodies of a basidiocarp varies wildly depending on the genus and the species. Some are small, even microscopic, while others are large and even heavy. Some grow underground, but most of them grow above ground. Most species release their spores through a blast or some kind of forceful discharge, but many lineages have lost this trait, and they just limply let go of their spores. And morphologically, there is tremendous variety in the shape, color, and structure of the fruiting bodies. The most iconic of these morphologies is the typical agaric mushroom, with its wide cap situated atop a vertical stalk. But whatever its shape, the fruiting body itself is a dense concentration of hyphae. Cellular filaments numbering in the millions are all tightly interwoven to create the firm but delicate tissue of the fruiting body. This tissue will form some kind of structure. The most well-known structure is the simple agaric mushroom. A stalk will rise from the ground, and a cap will expand from the tip and flatten out. On the underside of the cap, there are cavities and depressions in the tissue that increase its surface area. Some mushrooms, for example, have thin gills. Others have parallel tracks of small tubes that look like pores from the outside. Some more exotic fruiting bodies are cup-shaped, or bowl-shaped, or even some kind of fully enclosed shape. I talked about fruiting bodies a lot in the earlier episode on fungal reproduction, but real quick, I want to run through the various types of fruiting bodies in the Basidiomycota. Now, as I've said three times now, the, the as I've said, uh, as I've said multiple times now, the most, I, as I've said multiple times now, the most iconic fruiting body is the mushroom, the, the agaric mushroom. As I've said multiple times now, the most iconic Basidiomycota fruiting body is the mushroom. These can be agaric mushrooms, with gills underneath their caps, or they can be bowl eat mushrooms, which tend to be a bit thicker and puffier, and whose caps have vertical tubes ending in pores along the bottom surface of the cap. Some fruiting bodies have a gasteromycety structure, 
where the fruiting body is ball-shaped, or kind of globular, and all of the spores are produced on the inside. There's also the jelly fungi, whose fruiting bodies are messy, jelly-like masses covered with a thin layer of spore-producing tissue. The clavarioid fungi have fruiting bodies that look like tentacles. Sometimes the tentacles will have short, stubby branches that look like smaller tentacles. And sometimes these tentacles have open, cup-shaped tips, which makes them look a lot like coral. The spores are produced inside of these branching tentacle arm structures. The hydnoid fungi have fruiting bodies with tooth-like structures on the bottom. The corticioid fungi have fruiting bodies that are sometimes smooth, but sometimes have spines and spikes. And the polypores, or the conchs, which grow in plants and on the sides of trees, have undersides that are studded with vertical tubes. The cantheraloid fruiting body technically has a stalk and a cap, but they aren't very distinct morphologically. The bottom of the fruiting body has folds and grooves, but these get shallower and smooth out near the tip of the cap. And there's more types of fruiting body structures besides these, but these are just some of the main types. Now, somewhere within this fruiting body, no matter what shape it takes, there's a specialized layer of spore-producing hyphal tissue called the hymenium. If the fruiting body has gills, the hymenium lines the gills. If the fruiting body has tubes, the hymenium lines the tubes. If the fruiting body is bowl or cup-shaped, then the hymenium lines the inside of the basin. If the fruiting body is a fully enclosed capsule, the hymenium lines the inner surfaces of the cavity and produces spores that will be released when the capsule is broken. This hymenium is a critically important tissue. It's heavily studded with basidia, which means that its cells are frequently undergoing karyogamy to become diploid, which then undergo meiosis to produce spores. Typically, these diploid cells will undergo meiosis to produce four haploid nuclei. These will migrate from the internal chamber of the basidia where they're formed into smaller chambers kept on the outside of the basidia. The basidia itself is a club-shaped structure, and at its tip there are four smaller bubble-like protrusions. These are like little subcells that are mounted at the tip and ready for release. They're kind of like escape crafts on a spaceship, if you will. After the four haploid nuclei are created through meiosis, the, the nuclei will migrate down to the tip of the basidia, where one nuclei will enter one of these little subcell containers, or globules, or escape craft. When a nuclei moves into one of these globules, it becomes a basidiospore, which is ready to be released. Each basidia will typically produce four basidiospores at a time. Curiously, this meiotic process is remarkably similar across most basidiomycota species. For example, the fungi Coprinopsis cinerea is a large, complex, multicellular basidiomycota fungi. It has filamentous hyphae that form a mushroom fruiting body. The C. cinerea is a great example of a complex, modern fungi. Now compare this to the fungi Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is a primitive, single-celled yeast fungi. It doesn't really have hyphae. It doesn't really have fruiting bodies. It's an ancient lineage that's distantly separated from the Copernopsis scenaria by over half a billion years of evolutionary divergence. And yet, the pattern of genetic activity behind this meiosis process, behind all of this spore production, is almost identical. These genes and their expression patterns are critically important to the fungi, and they've been preserved for more than half a billion years. It's kind of an extreme example of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. However, this doesn't mean that the processes haven't gotten a little more complicated. The whole point of all of this spore production is to facilitate reproduction, but basidiomycota mating is incredibly complicated. If you've been listening to this, this whole series, you've heard me say countless times now that fungi are complex and highly varied. There's so much variety that it's actually really hard to make accurate generalizations, because there's always going to be a ton of exceptions and permutations. The most common sexual mating process in the Basidiomycota is called heterothalism. 
Remember, the term thallus means a mass of vegetative tissue that isn't differentiated into any kind of specialized structure. In the context of the fungi, the thallus is just a regular old mycelia. It's not a fruiting body or an apressorium or any other kind of infection structure or anything else. It's not any kind of specialized organ. In heterothallic mating, two individuals are needed to contribute their genetic material. Either they release spores that bind to the other and form a dicaryotic offspring, or the parent's hyphae will physically meet and fuse to form a dicaryotic offspring. The other type of sexual mating process is called homothalism, which is a form of sexual reproduction that only involves one individual. Now, right off the bat, it might seem really weird to say that this is a form of sexual replication, because there's only one individual involved but you'll soon see why. In traditional asexual replication, the individual will produce clonal spores through mitosis, and all of those spores will have the same genome. But in homothallic sexual replication, the one individual will produce genetically varied nuclei through meiosis, and these nuclei will fertilize each other. Unlike sexual replication between different individuals, this kind of homothallic sexual replication doesn't really produce that much new genetic variety. It's not a very effective way to generate and sustain genetic diversity across the species. However, it does have one proposed benefit. There are DNA repair processes that are active during meiosis, and this kind of homothallic sexual replication, while it won't produce genetic variety, it does give the fungus a chance to repair its DNA, which is really useful if it lives in a stressful environment. And it's also really useful if it's the descendant of a clonal population, because clonal lineages can often accumulate mutations. And so if you can go through this meiotic cleansing process to clean up and repair the DNA a little bit, well, that'll just make the resultant fungi a little bit healthier. Alright, so now that we've done a quick run-through of the Basidiomycota anatomy and reproduction, we can really start digging into the biodiversity of the clade itself. The Basidiomycota are incredibly diverse, and they include countless species of beautiful, exotic, and or chemically powerful organisms. The clade used to be divided into the Homo and Heterobasidiomycetes, but this division is considered obsolete. A more modern classification scheme, based on genetic analysis, has four major divisions at the subphyla level. These include the Pachiniomycotina, the Ustilaginomycotina, the Agaricomycotina, and the Wallemiomycotina. I'll start with this last subphyla, because it only has one class, so I can cover it pretty quickly. The Wallemiomycotina subphylum has a single class, the Wallemiomycetes. This class has a single order, the Wallemioles. This order has a single family, the Wallemiacea. And this family has a single genus, the Wallemia. Within this genus, there are seven described species, and all of them are characterized by their extremophile nature. They are halophilic, meaning they can handle exposure to extremely high salt concentrations. And they're also xerophilic, which means that they don't need that much water. They can endure extreme drought and desiccation for long periods of time. The Puccinio-Mycotina subphylum includes more than 8,400 species. There is tremendous variety in this clade, but they all share one feature. The septa of their cells all share the same kind of pores, and they contain large quantities of the structural carbohydrate, mannose. Most of the Pachiniomycotina are plant parasites, including the notorious rust fungi. The rust fungi are perhaps some of the most complex species in the entire fungal kingdom. Their life cycle alone typically involves two kinds of plant hosts, and five different stages of reproduction that each has its own type of spore-producing structure, and each type of spore that gets produced is very host-specific. So to do a quick rundown of the spores of these rust fungi, they first produce delicate spore-making structures called pycnidia. These pycnidia create haploid gametes that will be used in heterothallic sexual replication. The next stage produces acea structures that produce acea spores. These are asexual dicaryotic spores 
that spread through the primary plant host and facilitate the infection. So they're asexual, so they're clonal to the parent, but they're dikaryotic, so they have two nuclei, but the nuclei aren't fused. The third stage produces uridia structures, which create uridiniospores. These rust-colored spores are often a defining feature, marking the progression or the return of the rust disease on the plant. The uridiniospores can reinfect the host, or they can infect new hosts of the same plant species. The fourth stage produces telia structures that make the teliospores. These teliospores are actually not involved directly with infecting plants, but rather, because of their thick walls and their sturdy structure, the teliospores are used to overwinter or to endure drought conditions. They're basically the spores that allow the fungi to survive in a harsh environment, and when conditions get a bit better, the teliospores will germinate and produce basidia, which then produce basidiospores. These basidiospores are the fifth type of rust fungi spore. They're produced in the spring, where they get dispersed by the wind to infect alternate plant hosts. Within the Pachiniomycotina subphylum, there's nine classes, and I won't go over them all in extreme detail, but just to give you a taste, uh, here's a few tidbits about them. The Atractiellomycetes are a moderately sized class of saprophytes that consume dead plant matter. The Pachiniomycetes include many species of rusts, or plant parasites, that form orange or reddish-brown patches on the leaves. These don't produce fruiting bodies like a typical mushroom or conch, but they do make plump little spore-producing structures called acea that look kind of like mucousy Cheerios. And there's also three classes that each have a single order, and within each lone order, there's a single family. And within each lone family, there's two genera. And in most cases, each of these genera only has one species. These classes include the Tritiorachiomycetes molds, the Classiculomycetes, and the Cryptomycocolicomycetes fungal parasites. A fourth class, the Mixiomycetes, also has one order, one family, and a single genus, with a single species. This is, quite literally, a single species that's in a class of its own. Depending on the type of rust fungi, they may express all or some of these spore stages. Macrocyclic rust fungi, for example, express all five spore types, while the microcyclic rust fungi only express the uridiniospores and the teliospores. Furthermore, some rust fungi require two unrelated plant host species, while other rust fungi only need one host species. During the infection process, the fungal hyphae will push into the plant cells where they will form absorptive structures called hostoria. These hostoria will start sucking up nutrients from within the plant cells, stealing those nutrients from the plant, and using it to fuel more fungal growth and the invasion of more cells. After a while, the fungus will produce a wave of spores, which can facilitate further infection of the host. And this process will repeat roughly every 10 to 14 days, so they regularly pump their host plant full of spores to continue the infection and to spread to other plants. The Ustilaginomycotina subphylum includes 1,700 species that are predominantly plant parasites. They can be found infecting various types of vascular plants, like monocots and various angiosperms. The Ustilaginomycotina have a two-stage life cycle. In the first stage, they grow predominantly as yeasts, but they can also fuse with a spore to produce a haploid hyphae. This haploid hyphae can infect plant tissue, and once it gets established inside of its host, it will change into the second growth form. It'll change into a dangerous parasitic dikaryotic mycelia with thick cell walls and aggressive spore production. At this stage, after the Astilogenomycotina has infected a plant, it's known as a smut. This name comes from a German word that means dirt, as the smuts look like dark brown or black tumors, and their teliospores can form a sickly, dark-colored dusting that coats the plant's leaves, seeds, and flowers. Now, as the fungal kingdom is defined by incredible variety, it should be said that there are many rust species where this is backwards. 
The filamentous mycelia is the vegetative form that grows and reproduces outside the host. But when it enters a host and becomes parasitic, it transitions into the yeast form. For example, there's the Phyllobacidiella genus, which includes fungi in the mycelial growth form. But when they infect a host, they turn into a single-celled yeast growth form known as the Cryptococcus. The infamous human fungal pathogen Cryptococcus neoformans is one such Basidiomycota fungi. These smuts represent a devastating infectious disease for plants, which steal their nutrients and hijack their reproductive systems to produce teliospores. The general concept is really similar to the infection process of the Pachiniomycotina, but overall it's a little less complicated, and it involves fewer spore types. Within the Ustilogenomycotina, there are four classes. The largest class is the Exobacidiomycetes, which includes eight orders and dozens of families. These are smut fungi that are associated with tumor-like growths in the plants that they parasitize. The smaller classes include the class Ustilogenomycetes, with over 1,400 species. The remaining classes are the class Malassesiomycetes, with one order, and the class Monilielomycetes, which also has one order. All right, so now we get to the sister group of the Ustilogenomycotina, which is the Agaricomycotina. The Agaricomycotina subphylum includes more than 21,000 species, and almost all of these, something like 98% of them, are in the Agaricomycetes class, which have agaric-like fruiting bodies. So this would include virtually all of the fungi known as mushrooms. The remaining 2% of them include some yeasts and some jelly fungi. Now before I go any farther, I should clarify that the jelly fungi are not a monophyletic clade. A fungus is considered a jelly fungi if its fruiting body is foliose and highly and irregularly branching with a consistency that's somewhat similar to rubbery jelly. This is a paraphyletic grouping, as some species from all of the major Basidiomycota divisions could be considered jelly fungi. It's a certain type of morphological style or pattern. Speaking of the morphology of the Agaricomycotina fruiting bodies, this is where we start to see absolutely incredible variety and natural beauty at the macroscopic scale. The Dacromycetes class includes 101 species, and of those that produce fruiting bodies, they're typically in orangish-yellow color, with a soft, lumpy, jelly-like physiology. In some species, the fruiting body is a waxy orange lump, the shape of rising bread. In still other species, the fruiting bodies are like soft little cups or goblets. Others produce elegant folding sheets of golden tissue, and others produce fruiting bodies that look like short, writhing yellow tentacles. The Tremelomycetes class includes 377 species, most of which are single-celled yeasts that only reproduce asexually. However, there's a few species that form fruiting bodies for sexual reproduction. The order Tremelolese, for example, includes fungal parasites, or fungi that parasitize other fungi. The order includes many yeast families, as well as families full of teleomorphic species that actually produce fruiting bodies. The Tremelolese fruiting bodies take the form of wrinkled wads of tissue, like rippling, lacy fabric with a gelatinous consistency, so these would be considered a jelly fungi. Hands down, the largest and most diverse class within the Agaricomycotina are the Agaricomycetes, with 100 families, over 1,100 genera, and close to 21,000 species. All members of the Agaricomycetes are teleomorphs, which means that they have a sexual stage where they produce macroscopic fruiting bodies. Some of them form ectomycorrhizal symbioses with plants, some of them are plant parasites, but most of them are detrivore saprobes that eat dead plant tissue, like the wood of a fallen tree. This is a critically valuable ecological service that I've explored in great detail several times before, in earlier episodes. In a nutshell, without fungi like this breaking down dead trees over millions of years, our contemporary carbon cycle might be too weak, you know, there might not be enough carbon to actually support a biosphere. So in that sense, this ability for fungus to break down wood 
is, uh, from a certain perspective, responsible for keeping all life on planet Earth going. That's, that's pretty incredible. And every time I explain this, I always repeat just how incredible this really is. Alright, so to break down the Agaricomycetes, let's explore the class starting with its most ancient lineages, and move towards the newest lineages. So the oldest lineage is the order Cantharalleles, which includes a diversity of species with wildly varied fruiting bodies. These include the gray-brown mushrooms of the tooth fungi, the orange and yellow blossoming shape of the Chantarales fungi, and the flat, effused, and crusty fruiting bodies of the Corticioid fungi. Then there's the Sebacinales, which, in comparison, is relatively small. It includes less than 100 species, with these form symbiotic ectomycorrhizal or epiphytic relationships with a wide diversity of plants, although they seem particularly fond of orchids. Then we come to the order Auriculariales, which includes about 200 species of wood-eating parasites and detrivores that generate lumpy, jelly-textured fruiting bodies. Moving along, we come to the Stereopsidales, which has two genera whose fungi mostly form crusty, corticioid fruiting bodies. Then there's the Phalomycetidae, which has a wide diversity of species with an equally wide diversity of fruiting bodies. Some of them, like the Clovaria delphici, have creepy club-like basidiocarps that stand straight up out of the ground, looking kind of like an alien plant, while others, like the Lantariaceae, are highly branching, and they look like tiny, sinister, leafless trees. The Phalales clade produces fruiting bodies with thick stalks and knobby caps that kind of look, as the name would suggest, like penises coming out of the ground. Other groups of species include the earth star fungi, which produce spore sacs wrapped in a flexible mycelial tissue. When dry, the tissue wraps around the spore sac and protects it. When it's wet, like in the rain, the tissue will unfold and lift the spore sac up off the ground so that it can be disturbed by the wind, or the rain, or by passing animals. And these disturbances help to spread the spores. I hope we're not speeding through the Agaricomycetes too fast, but as we move on, we'll pass the 100 or so parasitic species of the Trechosporales, the approximately 600 species of wood-eating Hymenochetales fungi, with their orange, tan, and brown fruiting bodies that can grow to massive sizes, the approximately 250 species of the ectomycorrhizal Theliophorales, and the 1,800 species of the Polyporales. The Polyporales are a really cool and important order, composed of white fungi and brown fungi. The white fungi can break down lignin, which is the stuff that gives wood its strength, while the brown fungi can break down cellulose. And together, they can render entire forests worth of trees down into bioaccessible nutrients. Skipping right along, we come to the Corticiales order, which is mostly made up of the crusty corticioid fungi that grows like a thick film across the surface of dead or dying plants. The order includes species that eat the dead and parasitize the living of all manner of plant species, including trees, grasses, cereal grains like rice, and even lichens. Here's an interesting fact. All but one of the species in this order have fruiting bodies with the corticioid growth form, growing like a, like a thin crust over their host plant. The one exception is the Marchandiumphalina foliacea species, which has an agaric or mushroom-like fruiting body. It can be found growing wildly in the dark and damp places within the forests of Venezuela. Then we pass the Japules, which only has two species. We pass the more diverse group of brown rot fungi known as the Gloeophyllales, and the mostly agaric species of Rasulales. At this point, we come to the massive order known as the Agaricales, which has over 13,000 species, including some of the most well-known types of mushrooms. These all have the typical stalk and cap structure, and under the cap, most of them grow their spores on gills, covered in hymenium tissue. Beyond this, there is considerable variation among the species, including a number of exotic traits. For example, there's the Omphalotus olerius, or the jack-o'-lantern mushroom, which is highly poisonous and glows in the dark. 
Its orange bioluminescent form can be seen poking out of fallen logs and dead trees littering the forest floor. Another example of exotic weirdness comes to us in the Satharella aquatica species, which is the only gilled mushroom species that's known to produce its fruiting bodies and release its spores underwater. There's also a study that reported on a single individual Agaricales fungi, which belongs to the Armillaria bulbosa species. This lone individual fungus is thought to be one of the largest and oldest living organisms on the planet. Scientists think that it's over 1,500 years old, and they estimate a total mycelial weight in excess of 10,000 kilograms, spread out over more than 15 hectares of forested land. That is an absolutely massive fungus. There's also the dangerous Amanita genus in the Agaricales, which includes species like the deadly Amanita virosa, also known as the Destroying Angel. This frightfully named mushroom deserves its reputation. It produces a toxin known as alpha-amanitin, which causes catastrophic and often fatal damage to the liver and kidneys. A single destroying angel mushroom cap contains enough alpha-amanitin to kill an adult human, which is really scary when you consider the fact that they look kind of like the common and quite edible portobello mushroom. This genus also includes the iconic and charismatic mushroom of the Amanita muscaria, which has a bright red color and fleshy white dots. It's also poisonous, but it's much less dangerous than the destroying angel, as the Amanita muscaria can be safely consumed after it's been cooked properly. All right, moving on again, we come to the Boletales order, with its 1,300 species of parasitic fungi that produce thick brown and gray mushrooms. There's the Amylocorticiales order, which is quite similar to the older Corticiales order in that most species produce flat, crusty, corticioid fruiting bodies, with rare exceptions that make an agaric fruiting body. And there's also the Lepidostromatales order, which is the only Basidiomycota order that's composed entirely of lichen. These Lepidostromatales live in the tropical forests, grasslands, and savanna of Africa and the Americas. The final order in the Agaricomycetes is the Atheliales, which are exclusively the kind of fungi that form thin, flat, crusty, corticioid fruiting bodies. Some of them feed saprophytically off of the fallen leaves and pine needles of temperate and boreal forests. Some of them form mycorrhizas to live symbiotically with their plant host. Some of them are parasites of tree, shrub, and lichen, and some of them even become lichen. Perhaps most curious of all, there's a species in the Athelia genus that has evolved a symbiotic relationship with the Reticulatermes genus, also known as termites. The fungus will produce small, dense nodules of mycelial tissue called sclerodia that kind of resemble termite eggs. The fungus will grow these sclerodia nodules in the egg chambers of the termites, which has two functions one function that benefits the fungus, and another function that benefits the termites. The sclerodia appear to emit or exude some kind of chemicals that actually improves termite egg health and improves healthy birth rates, and that helps the termites. It makes them healthier, and it makes their, their eggs more likely to hatch into healthy babies. The fungi also benefits, because the termites are tricked by the appearance of the sclerodia, and the bugs will treat the nodules as if they were termite eggs. The termites will move the sclerodia around the nest, and as they handle this fungal mass, small spores and pieces of mycelia will rub off on the termites' limbs. These spores can then be carried along as the termite scuttles around, and so the fungus can spread to new areas. It's a cool little symbiosis, where the termites unwittingly cultivate the fungus in their nurseries, and the fungus pays them back by making their eggs healthier. That's a pretty awesome little symbiosis between fungi and animal. All right, everyone, we have come to the end of the show. This has been episode 71, exploring the biodiversity of the phylum Basidiomycota. If you liked what you heard, then hit the like button. And if you like all my content, then subscribe so you can get new episodes right when I post them, like the next episode, which will explore the relationship 
between humans and fungi. Check out the store, support the show on Patreon, and as always, thanks for listening.